American politics hardly needed something new to rattle it, but the advent of artificial intelligence promises or maybe threatens to do just that in an already tumultuous election year. Corey Alpert is a founding partner of South and West, an American political consulting firm, and he is now pursuing a PhD at the University of Melbourne, researching the implications of artificial intelligence for democracy, and he joins us now here in our studio. It's great to meet you. Thanks for coming in. Likewise. Thanks for having me. I left out a bunch of stuff in the intro, which I'm going to add right now. For example, I mean, you're, you're 29 years old. Correct. But already, you worked on Pete Buttigieg's attempt to become the Democratic presidential nominee. You've worked for Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. You were, quote unquote, advance lead in the White House mm -hmm. in the Biden administration. Yep. So the first question is, what's an advance lead? <laughs> so the advance team in the White House, we travel around the country and travel around the world helping set up events and public engagements uh, for the president, the vice president, and their spouses. Uh, so from the beginning of the Biden administration until the end of December last year, uh, I helped all four of those principals travel around and communicate the message of the Biden-Harris administration uh, around the United States and around the world. So, so you, you know Kamala Harris pretty well. I've gotten to spend a lot of time around her and her team, absolutely. The Kamala Harris that you deal with behind the scenes off camera and the Kamala Harris we see on the hustings and on the Stephen Colbert show and on 60 Minutes and all of that, how different are those two people? I think they're pretty similar. Uh, now that said, I, uh, you know, my, my engagement is really on the logistics end, uh, but she's warm, she's funny, she'll always crack a joke with us behind the scenes, uh, and she's really, really smart. Uh, that her prosecutorial history comes out and it's really engaging and it keeps you on your toes in the best possible way. You know that she she wants to make sure that the best information's out there. This is where I push back and say, yeah, but you know, she went through staff like you know what through a goose the first couple of years and was reputed to have a terrible temper. Mm -hmm. So is she really the same person we see on the air compared to behind the scenes? So look, I did not spend a whole lot of time in, in closed rooms. I worked on a team that was sort of separated out uh, and, and helped support her as well as her husband, as well as the president and the first lady. Uh, but look, I think the beginning of the administration is tough for any new administration. Uh, and I think that a lot of the rumors and content about the vice president were uh, tricky conversations uh, and ones that are uh, deeply rooted in an understanding of what a vice president is supposed to be. Uh, and here, just to put a fine point on it, I think that a lot of the commentary was uh, sexist and, and sort of misaligned to who she is as a person. Now that said, uh, I think that the first, and having been there, I think the first about year and a half, uh, I don't think the staff understood the leadership that she was trying to provide. And I think she also had a big learning curve. Mm. Um, you know, the being the vice president means you have a staff of several hundred, and it means you have conflicting priorities that are happening all over the country. Uh, and I think that there was a huge learning curve that it seems like in the last year or so, uh, things have really improved. Hmm. Uh, but I think the first year or so, I think it was about equal measure. Uh, folks on the inside not really understanding how to communicate with one another. Well, let me get your view on this because the Democratic Party did something astonishing that sure. I think nobody's ever seen happen before, which is, you know, the guy who's got the job made a pretty radical decision not to seek re-election. And rather than go through some primary process, they just installed the Veep and that was it. Do you think something was missed? Something that might have been helpful to the Democratic Party by not having a process by which to pick Joe Biden's presidential nomination successor? So yes, but to, to take one step back before then, there are some logistics here uh, in that the Biden campaign, what was the Biden campaign, uh, could only ever send the money in the logistical operation to Kamala Harris. Uh, so at a certain point, had he had the party gone with anyone other than Kamala Harris, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. And that what you'd have to return? Uh, 
very likely, I'm not an, I'm not a lawyer, not an expert on, on the legal side of that, but uh, no other candidate would be able to pick up that campaign apparatus in the way that Kamala Harris did. When she began her campaign, she began with hundreds of field offices across the country, a headquarters staff of hundreds. Uh, no other candidate would have been able to do that. So there's a practicality to having her take over. There is, but to, to your question more specifically, I do think there's a huge value in having candidates uh, articulate their case to the Democratic uh, to the Democratic electorate. Uh, I voted for Joe Biden in the South Carolina primary, which was first in the nation this year. Uh, that said, in the condensed time frame, I don't know that, that we would have gotten a lot, but I do think that we, we did lose out a bit on not having some kind of competitive uh, system. That said, uh, I think that Kamala Harris had about the best campaign rollout anyone could ever have had in those first couple of days. And the question is, did you end up with the best possible candidate, though? I don't know that we're ever going to have an answer to that. Right. Uh, I think that uh, in 2020, we had an incredible process. Uh, and I think a highlight of global democracy is the American primary system, where you had something like 24 candidates in 2019 and 2020 running with some level of viability. Mm. Uh, and I think it was about the healthiest thing for our democracy in the United States to have that number of people articulating visions ranging from sort of the center right all the way to the far left uh, and going in and retail politicking with voters. And I think it was great. Uh, and I do think that we miss out when we don't continue to do that. But in that condensed a time frame and with an existential threat, the likes of Donald Trump is representing, uh, I, 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 that balance is quite tough, and no, I don't understand. know that I would have made a different decision. The one thing people ask me when I'm out there talking politics with people more than any other thing is, okay, she was vice president for three and a half years. Tell me one thing she accomplished. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, so I'll put that question on their behalf to you right now. Sure. You know, never mind that she's not Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That might be a good reason to vote for her. She's sure. not Donald Trump. But what's she done on the positive side of the ledger that would give people confidence to say, okay, I think she can do this bigger job? Sure. Uh, so on the one hand, to, to temper that expectation, the vice president has no assigned responsibility in the Constitution or law other than, I believe there's a law that assigns her to be the, the chair of the National Space Council. Well, and she's got to break uh, ties in the Senate. Correct. So other than that, it's, it's, an, it's a blank slate. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of... Uh, you've seen her uh, go out and do a lot on voting rights, on the border, uh, and I think that there's been, to be honest, some mixed results. Uh, and I think that, that she's been put in a tough position, as every vice president is, of being the face of an administration without any real authority. Mm. Uh, that said, um, I think you've seen her lead on things like uh, capping insulin prices uh, for Americans to $35 a month. Uh, I think you've seen her lead on the, the fight on abortion rights. Uh, and I think she's been a, a key voice in bringing together coalitions. And I think most of what she's done as a leader is bringing together those coalitions like you've seen in the eight states that have passed abortion rights referendums. Uh, she's, I think, been a, a leader in building those coalitions in a way that only someone of a historic nature can do. Mm. If there's one thing both the parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, seem to have in common, it's that they both believe that if the other guy wins, mm -hmm. it's going to be an existential crisis for sure. democracy. Do you think American voters see it that way? I don't think so. I don't think the average voter sees it that way. Now, look, democracy is, I believe, the third most important uh, issue in this election behind immigration and the economy in, in some order there. Uh, but that said... I think the hyperpartisans, probably myself among them, uh, do see one candidate or the other uh, as a kind of existential threat to American democracy. I think the average American voter isn't as clued into that. Uh, they they look and they see two very different futures for the country, uh, but I don't think they see it necessarily as an existential threat one side or the other. Well, that, put it put put it. Uh, I've always believed, and tell me I'm wrong, you know, I've been doing this a little while, but tell me, tell me I'm wrong. I've always believed most people, doesn't matter if you're here in the province of Ontario or the United States of America, mm -hmm. are pretty moderate, pragmatic people sure. who hang around the middle, and you've got a group of sort of smaller extremists on either end yep. of the political continuum who watch a lot of cable TV and spend too much time on social media yep. and make things crazy for the rest of us. Yep. 
Does that sort of align with what you think is going on? I think that's absolutely right. And I think that that's what you're seeing in the campaign right now. You have both candidates trying to tack towards the middle. Uh, you know, you're seeing Donald Trump soften his position sort of via J.D. Vance on abortion rights. You're seeing Kamala Harris uh, change, modify and change some of her positions, especially on foreign policy. And guns. And guns. Uh, I think that was a very clear example in that interview recently. So... I think that's right. I think the vast majority of the American electorate, as within most Western countries, is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I think they're easily swayed to either mm. side based on the mood of the country. Right. Let's do some. Here, we got some numbers here. Um, yes, your country is polarized, but there does appear to be some common ground held on the issue of artificial intelligence. Sure. So here's the Pew Research Center in a survey from September of this year. Almost the same percentage of Republicans as Democrats say AI will be used mostly for bad mm -hmm. during the 2024 presidential campaign. And similarly, more than half of those surveyed in both parties say they are extremely or very concerned about AI's influence on the election. Sure. Have we finally hit on a bipartisan issue here? <laughs> I think we have. Uh, I, but I think the, the thing that I'm always interested in polls like that is what do people mean by AI? Uh, this is a question that I get asked quite a lot, and I think this is a question most people interested in the topic of AI get asked is, what do we mean by AI? It, it's a huge swath of technology that can range from your Netflix suggestions all the way to things like the generative AI you see in ChatGPT. Mm. So, uh, but I do think it's right, and I, I agree with, with that percentage of Americans that I am nervous about the impact that AI is having, both in terms of its capacity to create misinformation. I think we've seen, uh, I think the most famous example would be the, the AI-generated images that Donald Trump made of Taylor Swift, which she even said directly caused her to then endorse Kamala Harris. Uh, but the thing I'm most interested in, and I think the thing that has the biggest impact in the US election uh, and elections broadly around the world, are these algorithms that are putting very polarizing information in front of people and information that may or may not be true. And I think the impact of that right now is being felt, especially uh, in the South in the United States, where people are being fed all kinds of information about uh, the hurricanes, and that is going to end up costing people's lives when they don't evacuate or when they believe lies like, the, like this idea that somehow governments can control hurricanes, uh, which just isn't true. Uh, but it's, it's driving this anger and this fear, and I think that's the thing that worries me the most uh, with those algorithms. The thing, I, I must confess, I try to keep off a lot of this stuff because it's better for my mental health if I don't Fair. spend 20 hours a day on that. But the, if, if you're running for office and they are somehow so skilled at being able to create a clip of you mm -hmm. saying something that you didn't say, mm -hmm. but nobody who's looking at it knows that, mm -hmm. I mean, that is just, the potential is rife for mischief there. Sure. What do we do about that? So... There are lots of questions on, on regulation here, and uh, I'll touch on that in a second, but I think this misinformation isn't so much a technical problem as a human problem. Uh, this, this problem of videos and images and text being false, that's not new. That's happened since the Romans, uh, where a fake speech gets published or fake audio comes out. Uh, in the age of radio, there were people who could impersonate politicians and go on the radio and broadcast something that someone never said. Uh, it's on steroids now, though. It absolutely is on steroids. Uh, so both the distribution and uh, its ability to be created. So we've lowered the bar for people to be able to create this kind of misinformation, and we've made it a lot easier for it to be distributed uh, and for it to be shared quite frequently. Uh, but it's also, I think there's a huge media literacy problem of, you know, you see videos of tr Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris saying things, and if you're reasonable followers of American politics, you know that's absolutely not something they would have said. So you mean the Pope did not endorse Donald Trump for president eight exactly. years ago? Exactly. Which I read online? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure Donald Trump shared that on, uh, <laughs> on Twitter or X. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a huge media literacy problem that can help head that off. But absolutely, the, the ability on both the supply and the demand side for this misinformation is massive. Meta says, the old Facebook people, mm -hmm. they say giving people the power to build community and bring the world closer together is their mission. Mm -hmm. Are they doing that? 
Yes and no. Uh, an interesting thing on Meta, they recently rebranded themselves, uh, and I think Mark Zuckerberg said that they're now an AI company. They're no longer a social media company, they are an AI company. Uh, I think in some ways they absolutely are. The question is what, what direction is that happening in? Uh, certainly people are coming together on Facebook, on Instagram, and on WhatsApp, on, on all of their platforms, they are coming together. Uh, I think that is undeniably true. Uh, the question is, are they coming together uh, with a basis of fact and with a basis of constructive political conversation? I think that answer is probably not. Uh, and I think we're seeing evidence of that continually. Uh, and I think we're going to see more of that as we get closer to this election. Is that how most people experience artificial intelligence as it relates to this campaign? That's a great question. I think uh, the way that most people are actually experiencing AI uh, as it comes to this election or any election is through those algorithms, is through they go on Facebook, they go on X, they go on Instagram, and they're not seeing information that their friends have shared. They're seeing a sort of curated version of what an algorithm thinks that they should see. And I think that in itself is a really, really difficult position to be because I think that we haven't quite caught up with how that all works. And it's a fundamentally alienating, alienating experience for people to go on these social media platforms and then not feel like they're in control of the information they're receiving and not know why they're receiving the information that they're getting. And then their views are shifting because of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how most people are experiencing this. Now that Elon Musk has gone full mega mm -hmm. and he owns X, mm -hmm. do we expect X to be sort of in the tank for Donald, I guess. We're already seeing that. Uh, you're seeing a tenfold rise in right-wing content being shown to people uh, on on X. Uh, Elon recently had a, a new rule uh, where even if you block someone, you're still gonna see their posts. Uh, and I think largely that was because he is actually the most blocked person on X and he wants to make sure everyone's still looking uh, at what he's, he's tweeting. Um, I think absolutely that's happening on X, that's happening on a lot of platforms where, uh, but X in particular, where right-wing content and polarized content of all kinds continues to be uh, the most popular and the most uh, engaged with content. But X in particular, I think because of Elon, absolutely we're seeing that. You're pretty savvy on this stuff. Have you ever been faked out by a deep fake of artificial intelligence? It's a great question, I don't think so. Uh, I think I'm pretty good, but that said, uh, if, if I have, then it was pretty good. I spend a lot of my time thinking about and looking at these systems, and there are times where I, I have a bit of a pause, uh, and they're getting better and better. Mm. Uh, so I don't think so, but maybe. Censorship, is that part of the solution? That's a great question. Uh, Love that long pause. We like long pauses here. It means the guests have to think. I think there's an element of, I'm hesitant to say censorship, but certainly of regulation. I don't think that censorship works. Uh, I think that limiting the ways in which people express their views ultimately will always end up backfiring. And I think that's a, a core part of sort of an American political identity. We, we very much believe in freedom of speech. Uh, and I think that limiting, and I think what we've seen is limiting the ability for people to post or talk about the things that they want largely has a an impact of driving them further back into those beliefs. Because especially right now, I think a lot of people, if their post is censored, uh, would go, oh, well that only means that big tech is against me or that uh, there's some group of elites that don't want me to have this opinion. And I think that's an incredibly dangerous place to be. But you can't say fire in a crowded theater. There Correct. are limits on free speech. Correct, and I do think that uh, there is smart regulation that we need to think about, because right now we still don't have a good regulatory regime around social media for things like dangerous speech. Uh, we're largely relying on the companies to do it themselves, and we're seeing that both on social media companies, but also on generative AI. You know, you saw Twitter, their, their, uh, their, AI gen their generative AI model, Grok, has no guardrails around it where places like ChatGPT and OpenAI invested quite a lot of money in bringing in experts to put safety guardrails and to understand how those tools can and should be used. But there, there are definitely nefarious actors and we're only relying on the companies to do it themselves rather than 
getting smart about how we create regulations and create safety guardrails uh, to make sure that people unknowingly aren't consuming uh, vast amounts of untrue information. Let's see if we can end this conversation on a reasonably upbeat note, if you think it's merited. It might not be merited. I can imagine, maybe not today, but at some point, a future where artificial intelligence combined with social media give users the power to really engage in direct democracy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's voting on bills or referenda or whatever it is, but it's a much deeper mm -hmm. and, and better and faster, more immediate stake in their own democracy. Mm -hmm. Am I nuts to hope, to, to hold out for the possibility of that? I don't think you're nuts to, to hold out that hope. Uh, and I think we saw a glimpse of this uh, in the period on, on social media before the algorithms were there. When uh, these social media platforms really were social networks. It was a way for us to connect with our friends very quickly and very rapidly uh, online. Uh, and then now, I, as we've been talking about, these algorithms have had uh, downstream effects. But uh, one thing that I've been really excited about is this ability for uh, new generations of people to come online and to organize and to build social movements uh, that have been really optimistic and hopeful. You know, you look at uh, disaster responses where people are going online and they're connecting with their community and they're using these platforms to do really great things. And they're right now, even in the political space, they can use these platforms to organize their friends and to get their voices out there. I have a lot of hope that there's that we can continue to do that. I think that requires, as we were talking about, smart regulation and, and uh, being able to protect uh, users and citizens from the worst impacts of, of uh, what these tech companies can do and what social media and AI can do more broadly. Uh, but I have a lot of hope that we can use these tools to organize and to communicate with our representatives and to build deeper trust and deeper relationships. But I think we're still at the very beginning of this new technology. Mm. And this isn't new. We had this exact conversation uh, with the advent of radio. We had this exact conversation with the advent of television. We had this exact conversation in the 90s with the advent of the internet. With the beginnings of any new information technology, we're always going to have a period of time that's turbulent where we're wondering, is this the death of democracy? And I don't think it is. I think that we're in a period where we have to grapple with what it means, where we have to grapple with the new ways in which people are communicating and how we do that. But I do think we'll get to the other side. And like with radio, you know, radio brought us uh, new ways of telling stories, new ways of uh, getting people uh, invested in the stories that matter in their lives. TV, as we're seeing here, helps bring stories into people's lives in even more tangible ways. But at the beginning, people didn't necessarily think of it like mm -hmm. that. And I think that the same thing is happening with these social media uh, companies and, and how we interact online. But we have to continue to ask these questions. It's an incredibly important role for the media. It's an incredibly important role for regulatory watchdogs and for civil society. to so continue asking these questions and to push us into that good direction because it's not guaranteed. But I have a lot of hope that we're gonna get there. Amen. Corey, as I thank you for coming on the program, let me just add how disappointed I am that your South Carolinian accent did not come out, nor did your Melbourne Australian accent come out at all either. <laughs> so I think you sound like a normal Canadian to me. I, it's, it's an interesting accent. Uh, <laughs> I, grew up, I grew up in rural South Carolina, and uh, this accent was sort of the affectation of, uh, there's a bit of a sad story, but uh, the affectation was when I grew up, Southern accents were seen as dumb. They were seen as stupid. Uh, Stephen Colbert, same story. Exactly, he's another South Carolinian. Yep. Uh, and a lot of us, we were told by our teachers who had deep Southern accents that we would never be taken seriously with that accent. And so I would actually watch the national news. I watched Tom Brokaw and would repeat how they said things. And that's what created this accent. And I now wish I had, I had at least a little bit more of that <laughs> accent uh, to be able to fall back on. Well, that's good to meet y'all. Likewise. <laughs> Corey Alpert. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.